The following presentation is part of the Beyond the Blast Doors Network. This is B. Fletzer, and welcome to Around the Galaxy, the Star Wars fan talk show. This week, we are joined by David Whiteley, award-winning BBC broadcaster, filmmaker, and author. Join us as we talk about his documentaries, Toy Empire, and the Galaxy Britain Built, as well as his Star Wars connection. So strap yourselves in, relax, and enjoy this journey around the galaxy. Welcome to episode number 99 of Around the Galaxy, the Star Wars fan talk show. I am your host, Pete Fletzer, and we are a part of the Beyond the Blast Doors Network. It's mind-blowing to me that we are on episode number 99. It's been a it's been a wild journey, a lot of fun. You know, every week we bring you a new perspective on Star Wars, whether it's from an author, a creator, an actor, a filmmaker, a super fan, and usually some sort of combination thereof. So I could not be happier to be joining uh, with you this evening on a really nice, uh, it's a little bit early for us, but it's a little late for our guest. So I'm excited that he's able to join us. So don't forget to follow us on Twitter at ATGCast, all the stuff that I got to tell you about, right? Don't forget to also join us on our website at beyondtheblastdoors.com where you can keep up with this show and all the shows on the Beyond the Blast Doors network. If you want to join us as a Patreon, well, of course we have that. It's the rule. If you have a podcast or a streaming show, you need to have a Patreon. And we do at patreon.com slash Beyond the Blast Doors. For as little as five bucks a month, you can support all five of the live shows that we have every single night of the week on the Beyond the Blast Doors network. On Wednesday night, you get Beyond the Blast Doors live. And this week, uh, 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 we are joined with uh, Jerry and Arzu and David, and they're going to have Adam Frazier from Slash Film on this week to talk about video games. On Thursdays, you get the Bombad cast, Jerry and Scotty. They're going to be playing Star Wars Mad Libs this week. I don't know how that's going to go, other than I know it's going to be insane and fun. And speaking of insane and fun, join us on Friday nights for our call-in show, Force Connect. And on Mondays, you get the Holo Chronicles. With uh, This week, they are joined by Bosk's Bounty. Next week on Around the Galaxy, we're going to be joined by Matt Stover, who is the author of the critically acclaimed Revenge of the Sith novel. Looking forward to that. But before we get there, I'm really excited to bring you this week's interview. This week, we're privileged to have an award-winning documentary maker. He was part of the BBC program Inside Out. But he's probably best known to Star Wars fans for his Star Wars uh, Extra YouTube channel. And his documentary is called Toy Empire and the Galaxy Britain Built. I am excited to bring you Mr. David Whiteley. David, great to see you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Pete. Thank you so much. And, it, and it's lovely to hear all the people you mentioned there. I, I feel like a lot of those are, are old friends as well, Adam Frazier and Bosk Bounty. And I think I know all these guys through 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 connecting on on social media through our our, our collective love of Star Wars. So it's such yeah. Them. The, 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 I, I saw your interview with Adam recently, and it's fantastic. Oh, he's he was a he was a blast, and it's so yeah. funny that you mentioned that. I mean, the Star Wars social media space is. I don't know. It's uh, especially perhaps in this uh, this time of of COVID, probably more important than ever. But it's been uh, it's been great, and it was a great opportunity to meet you. And I'm I'm really excited for you to join me. And I'm not going to lie; I'm a little bit nervous talking to you know a, a journalist. You you're <laughs> well, supposed I'm, to be I'm interviewing never you. <laughs> I never told you. I, as I say, Pete, uh, you know, I said to you before we came on air that you know I've, I've seen a lot of your work, and I I think you're a fantastic interviewer, and I'm. I'm very flattered to be on on the show. So, and thank okay. you for changing the time. This is my fault. This is my fault. <laughs> you're having to do this so early. Uh, no, no <laughs> worries. I think uh, my family's happy. I'll be done early. They'll be able to spend a little time with me. So, David, for the for the people who may not know you, maybe give us a little bit about your background and tell us a little bit about you and your your uh, your Star Wars journey. Okay. Um, well, um, goodness me, my my Star Wars journey. Um, obviously, a lot of people come to come to uh, Star Wars through through all kinds of things and and um, and all kinds of uh, genre with, within within Star Wars. You know, I was I was of the original trilogy. Um, I I was actually born. My birthday is May the fourth, nineteen seventy seven. So Star Wars Day, the year Star Wars came out. So and I and I didn't really. And people said to me, you know, so obviously I, I grew up with Star Wars and I and I I fell in love with it. The first movie I saw in, in the movie theatre was Return of the Jedi in 1983. So I was six. Before then, I'd seen Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back on on our on our VCR and the old VHS top loader. Uh, yes, yep, yep, yep. We had and and I and I just fell in love with Star Wars and and you know all my life it's been 
it's it's always been there and and i've always loved it and it was only as i kind of got older people said to me do you realize your your birthday's your birthday star was there and i hadn't really kind of twigged that you know i hadn't really right. twigged that it was i thought oh, yeah yeah so so the day i was born you know so when i was born star wars came out made three weeks after i was born right uh, yeah so right. It's, it's always been a part of my life i think but in the UK, it actually didn't. If I'm right, it didn't come out till later, right? I mean, oh, yeah. we, uh, we it was it was running wild here in the states, and then uh, you had you had some. It took a while to get through to you guys. Outrageous, Pete. Outrageous. Yeah, it was uh, December twenty seventh, nineteen seventy seven. So um, unlike today, when when obviously movies you know, pretty much release simultaneously around the world at the same time, or on a streaming service now, right? <laughs> well, of course, yeah, exactly. But can you imagine? You know, so so all the hype of of Star Wars. You know, in, right. in 1977, and if, if you're in the UK, and you know, at the time in the news in the UK, a lot of people knew that that Star Wars had been had been filmed in Britain, had been filmed right. at Elsby Studios, and a lot of British talent behind it. And and you know, they, they they're seeing on the news all these clips of Star Wars and Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, there's Peter Cushing and Sir Alec Guinness uh, and Dave Prowse, the British guys, and we're not seeing Star Wars. And and actually, most people didn't really see Star Wars in the UK until. You know, early '78, probably more towards the end of 1978. By the time it actually kind of rolled out, because they only had so many uh, prints of the film, so it's kind of moved around the country. So it was a long time before it it really landed in in the whole of Britain. It's it's it is really kind of hard to imagine now that that kind of a distribution schedule. Different world, yeah, yeah. Um, but so it, you know, we'll 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 fast forward. We'll go. We'll jump all over the place. But I want to tell talk a little bit about. You mentioned what I think is really interesting is that there was so much of the talent that came from Britain. So much of it was um, uh, uh, built and filmed in Britain. And that inspired you to create uh, a documentary called uh, The Galaxy Britain Built. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I mean, it was, it, I mean, I, the funny thing is, is that, is that I, I, I've seen you, you talk to, to, when you talked to Amy the other day and about her fabulous book about Star Wars and, and they were kind of the wilderness years of, of hmm. Star Wars. Right. Um, I, and I think that that those times when uh, there were there are a few kind of diehard Star Wars fans because uh, there was no social media, no internet, internet obviously. So you were kind of flying the flag for, for Star Wars, and you were kind of you know the odd little convention here and there. Um, <laughs> and there were kind of those wilderness years, you know, post nineteen eighty three, and you know, and nobody wanted the toys anymore, and, it, and there was talk of the prequels and talk of TV shows, and nothing happened. And then, you know, fast forward to 1999 and we get the, the prequels and everything kind of bubbles up again. But for me, I think, you know, I really I really enjoyed the prequels. And but but I think when when The Force Awakens came out, I really kind of, you know, reignited my my love of, of, of Star Wars. And I, mm -hmm. I'd been I'd been at the BBC for, for quite some time. I was presenting and fronting a, a BBC One TV show called Inside Out Current Affairs Programme. So I'm making documentaries as a producer and a presenter. And then I, I was in I was in London on a shoot. And I was coming home on the train, and I just flicking through Twitter as one does idly, <laughs> and I, I saw that I saw that Mark Hamill was doing a, a talk to the Cambridge Student Union. Mm -hmm. I thought, wouldn't it be great to to interview Mark Hamill? Being a, obviously everyone wants to interview Mark Hamill, so I, I got in touch with them, and and you know it was agreed that that it would it would happen, and Mark was happy to do it, and then. Uh, Lucasfilm production got involved. Said, "I'm sorry, we can't, we can't do that at the moment." I said, "Okay, mm -hmm. fair enough." So I then went through the kind of the, the the channels. I thought, "Wouldn't it be, would it be great to kind of look at the British talent?" Because I think, I think for me, as uh, you know, a, a, a filmmaker and as a, and a Star Wars fan, I kind of always realised that it was filmed in the UK. Right. right. And even at that point in my life, I hadn't really kind of grasped just how much of it was 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 down to British talent. Um, yeah. Uh, who who kind of rallied around Georgia and, and Gary Kurtz and 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 obviously the, the incredibly talented American guys, you know, doing the special effects, right. know, John Dykstra and all the gang, you know, in in California, the groundbreaking special effects. Uh, but of course, all the practical stuff and and the set building and the and the costume designing was done was done in the UK. So then I kind of set about, and it's really weird because the the title came to me straight away. And I think once you got the title, you then kind of. <laughs> You could then hang everything off it. You think, oh, the Galaxy Britain built. Okay, well, that yeah, Galaxy is kind of associated with Star Wars, obviously. Yeah, sure. Um, and then it kind of went from there. And, and then I kind of set off on this path, Pete, to kind of find the people that, because, you know, we've all seen the fabulous behind the scenes documentaries like Empire right. of Dreams, mm -hmm. a wonderful documentary. And it's two hours long when there's, and you've got 
um, Norman Reynolds in there, who was who was production designer, um, mm -hmm. and, and Robert Watts, who was production supervisor. Um, but they're in it very briefly. Um, and to be fair, on, on Lucasfilm and Disney, can you imagine doing an entire comprehensive Star Wars documentary on everybody that worked on A New Hope? Yeah, <laughs> we've got, I've got, you know, I've got um, J.W. Rinsler's book in front of me here, Making of Star Wars, and that's that's comprehensive. Yeah. So, so I kind of, so my mantra was to kind of just look really at what the Brits did, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and as kind of a an affectionate look at, at what the Br British guys did um, all those years ago. It's interesting because I, as I was watching your your documentary and also the 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 Toy Empire documentary, which I want to talk about in a moment, but the um, it's interesting. It struck me that I don't know if there's ever been a film that has had so much documentation around its creation, and you know, and I I, I think that's what really rang true for for me for with with uh, with your documentary is it really does take a different angle, and it really and when you think of it, I mean, you you got to talk to the 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 uh, the gentleman who created the original lightsaber and 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 saw that so I, I, you know i think a lot of people also don't recognize that star wars was such a hodgepodge at times it was just let's pull this together let's pull that together and they used the talent that they had they they weren't flying people in from from the us because it's a it's a famous costume designer they used a gentleman who was there it who was who was excellent at his job in in the uk but wasn't the guy that maybe they might have had in mind i mean in fact you you had the last interview with john mollo i think right is that correct yeah 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 john mollo um so if you could see that there Pete, that's that's a um, one of his copies of his of his designs of of chewbacca and, okay and, you know we we actually had the very last so so i'd say to track john mollo down and john mollo won he, he had the, he got the academy award for, for costume design on star wars and on gandhi as well Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote to somebody. I wrote to an address. I found an address for who I thought was for John Muller. And because I had a BBC uh, envelope, it all got sent off and, and it, then they moved, but it got forwarded on by, by the people that had bought the house. Okay. Um, and then I got this phone call one day at my in my office desk and it was John Muller's wife, Louise, and mm -hmm. she was fantastic. And she said, look, you know, um, John's not been very well, but I know this would be a real, you know, be a real boost to him if you could come and do the interview. And of course, we would say, well, that was it. Off we went. You know, we, yeah. we we one we drove to Oxfordshire, and um, we went into the. And she said, "Oh, have you, do you do you want to see? Do you want to see the the piece de resistance?" And we said, "Well, okay." So we sat down, and then she she went to the to the vast bookshelves. You know, book books upon books, all these sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. His his entire life there, because he also was the costume designer on Alien and all these other amazing things. Okay. He started pulling out these books. <laughs> She laid them out. She laid them out. Uh, and I'm trying to be professional at this point. And 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 she said she she said she she'll never we've, we've stayed in touch with good friends. And she said she'll never forget the moment when I was trying to I was trying to be professional <laughs> and conduct this interview and say oh to the camera guys let's let's get a shot of this. But it, but I was like bursting with excitement because th here we had all the development and the evolution of all these characters that we now know and love and. They're in our pop culture and in our psyche. And of course, here they are in John's sketchbooks. And this is just the very beginning. So of course, yeah. you know, you've got the fabulous concept art from Ralph McQuarrie. Right. And and through George's interpretation, he he was talking with John and they were kind of structuring how that should be in in the in in the final in the final film, in how it should yeah. finally look. So you've got all the evolution. And he said, and even if you've seen the documentary, he says, you know, there's did a Chewbacca. He said it wasn't very good, and it looks ridiculous. And he said, "Then we did this one," and we <laughs> laughed together. And he, he was he was very modest. He was a very modest and very talented man. Um, you know, really, really great guy. Um, and 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 I think, as you say, a lot of a lot of the look of Star Wars um, was down to was down to the fact that they didn't have any money. Right. There, was, there was no money around, so it was a, a question of of beg, borrowing, and stealing. And if it looked right. Yep. If it looked right, that was the mantra. It went in. It went in the movie. Yep. Um, so, so they were getting bits of junk. They were using old airplane junk. So the whole of the back of of uh, the Moss Eisley Cantina is all this space junk. Uh, it's all this junk from from um, old planes. They flew around. I mean, I never put this in the documentary, but they flew around parts of the UK to all of these old junkyards uh, oh, wow. at, at um, airports to get the stuff because it was cheap. They right. got it all back to Elstree Studio, stripped it down, and Roger Christian, who was the set decorator, would put it in the in the set. 
it's it's wild and it's it's funny because like you said it is it, it's it must have been amazing to see those original sketches because yeah. it's what we take for granted right and now it's so funny the way star wars has evolved like when we were kids and we saw it it was we just soaked it in a step before that was the stuff that uh, that that John was doing, where he was designing it, and he was pulling from Ralph McQuarrie's sketches. And I read a quote somewhere, and I wish I could remember where it is because I, I reference it quite often. Of Ralph McQuarrie at one point said, "There's no way any of this is going to look good on film." And and but now you look, you flash forward in 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 my office down the hall, I have all the books that now have like, well, the reason that little pouch is on his belt is because that carries blah, blah, blah. So there's now stories behind things that just happen to be like, are we going to use this? Let's put it on the thing there. And, it, and now it's got a story, right? So, oh man, that's so, that's so true. Pete, I get that all the time. People, people, people tweet me and say, oh, is the, David, you, you know, these things. Um, yeah. The reason that Greebly is on there is because of this. And I think, I think, well, no, it's because they had no money. It's any old bit of took that came from a, an old camera. You know, it's something that came from, from a clock you know it's it, you know it doesn't it, it's now of course everything as you say has a backstory yeah you yeah. know and they then go okay well this this looks it okay so okay this this communicator that c3po has let's make out that it was you know and then the, then the, everything has a story of course it does because then you create the fabulous galaxy that we all love but at the time they were just going to stick it all together yeah. um and you, and you mentioned that you know these guys were were, were in the UK. Well, George and, and and Gary Kurtz went down to to um, to New Mexico where they were filming a movie called called Lucky Lady, um, and and yeah. and it was it was um it was written by um oh uh, two friends of theirs who who've been co writers on on um, American Graffiti, and they'd been really helped them with with American Graffiti, and they and they were writing this movie. Uh, Stanley Donner was was directing it. Uh, and the, the the set guys were were the British guys that so they said come down to to, to New Mexico, so they got George and Gary down there. Uh, they met the, they met the, the production team, and because they loved what they were doing with these old sets of westerns and sets and stuff, they basically hired them on the spot. <laughs> so so they, so they then got them all back to London, and then they were all hired as the as the, as the talent that would work on uh, creating the look of, of of Star Wars for George Lucas. It's it's amazing that the difference in in uh, the way films are 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 made. I mean, it, sure, it was a film business, but it was more at least at that time for that particular movie. Like you said, there wasn't a lot of money. It was let's what what did George want to see? What did he want to bring into it? And and if he saw it, he liked it. He ran with it, which is which is wild. Um, so you did you act? You were actually you saw the original lightsaber, right? And you you talked to the gentleman who produced it. What was that like as a you know as a Star Wars fan? We talked about it at the beginning. We we're we've grown up with Star Wars. It's been such a part of our lives. It's influenced things we've done and things we. But that is that's that's the Star Wars prop, right? I mean, not sure. There's the Falcon and the Tie Fighters and all that, but the the lightsaber. How did it feel to like be in the room with the, not not just anyone, but the the first one that was put together? Yeah, it's one of the first. So, so, um, so the story the story goes. Um, obviously, you see the documentary, Pete. That that um, Roger Christian, he was a set decorator, and he managed to to pull everything together. And he got um, he made Hans Blaster, Princess Leia's Blaster, Chewie's Bowcaster, all that kind of stuff was all together. And the one thing they didn't have, they're about to ship out to Tunisia to do to do the very first filming of of the movie for ta for the Tatooine scenes, and they didn't have. Um, what would become Luke Skywalker's lightsaber, as we now know, as Anakin Skywalker's. Um, mm -hmm. so, so he went to this place uh, in London where they hired all the camera equipment, and and he said to the guy there, uh, he said, "Have you got anything in this? You know, anything that might look like this?" And he said, "Go and look in those boxes there." And he opened the box, mm -hmm. and there are about six to eight of these things. And there was the flash handle of a nineteen thirties, nineteen forties press camera. So you hit that, and the flash bulb went off. If you look at the camera, you can see it. If you go on Getty Images, you'll see these things. And it looks like, you know, you can see it looks, it's literally, you know, Luke Skywalker's the hilt yeah. for, for the lightsaber. So so he saw them in this box and he bought a whole load of them. He took them back to to, to Elstree Studios and he put a load of uh, rubber T-strip, you know, the, the, on around the yeah. handle. He, he cut out a bit of uh, a bubble strip from a, from a calculator, slid it into the clip. Um, and and that was literally that is literally all he did. So he phoned George up. And George came up, and the only thing that George added was a belt clip, and that was it. And and Roger had a few of those, um, and he got to keep. Well, he made one up for himself as well at the time. So he made a load up, and he kept one. <laughs> and so so in the so he then he now has it to this day. And Roger now lives in Canada, so we flew him over to the UK 
the documentary um and we've become good mates and he, he said he said i, I said well, you've got to bring it with you you've got to bring it for the for the shoot and of course he does and he brings it in this bag and it's and he gets it out of the bag and he's and he's waving it around because to him it's like well he's had it forever you know sure and, right. I'm, and i'm sitting there doing the interview like this and i want to uh, and i said to the and i said to the crew i said to the guys i said well, i think we should do a wide shot or do a two shot me and roger and we'll get roger to hand me the, the lightsaber and he and he hands me the thing and i think and he and he, and he said just as you would imagine you know you see in the film when when he when obi-wan kenobi hands it to luke and it's sure. got that weighted feel it feels just like that and it wow. and it just had and it's just well it but it basically it's it's off a bit of a camera basically that's all it is <laughs> Um, but it looked the part and, and they didn't have any money. So, so that was it. So, so that was, that was it. And so to this day, it's the same thing. That, that's, that's great. And yeah. And it's now evolved and it's such, again, there's a story behind it and all the things that, that go with it. And I, I, I don't, uh, I've told this story once or twice, but I did have the opportunity to go to, um, to the ranch, uh, Skywalker ranch in, wow. uh, in California once. And I was doing the tour and at the time, this was before the, the renovations this was back in the uh late 90s i guess it was early 2000s late 90s and um there wasn't a lot of props around uh the ranch which i expected to see everywhere there was one little tiny hallway and in there was like a walker and a snow speeder and and but the one that impressed me and stuck in my head the most was the idol from raiders of the lost ark because it was basically a wooden block that was painted gold and it's beat to crap. I mean, it is beat up, but it just, just to see that thing, it's just, and it's, it's wild the way things come to life on screen. And, and I think that's one of the, the interesting things about your documentaries is, um, and, and maybe, maybe this is one of the things that you love about doing. It's one of the things I love about doing this show is uncovering things. I mean, you were literally sort of on a, on a treasure hunt doing, doing yeah. these things, trying to find these different, these things. Were there any pieces of the documentary that, that you, any stories that you wish you could have kept in, but had to edit out to time? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I think it's a really, uh, thank you for saying that it was a treasure hunt actually. And that's, that's, I've never heard anybody describe it as that because um, it, it was. And, and I kind of thought that even, even when we'd spoken or I'd spoken with, you know, cause I, I had a very short space of time to pull everything together and get the people I could find and, and you know it was it was conference calls in the middle of the night because of time differences, etc. And and I thought by kind of doing my research first and chatting to, to people on the phone and and uh, before we, so I, I thought I would know everything. So so <laughs> I kind of thought well I could kind of pretend to be surprised and all that kind of stuff. But every interview we did, I was like really sorry. So we always had two cameras running because because you, you couldn't fake that that kind of wonderment from the star Wars fan. who was, yeah, making yep. movies. so, so you had to kind of, you had to have it rolling on me all the whole time, but there were so many occasions, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, so we made the documentary twice. We kind of, we got, we got to do a George Lucas and do a special edition. So we, <laughs> so we had an hour long version first. And then um, 18 months ago, I got, I, I persuaded the BBC to let me make the proper definitive version. Mm. Which I always wanted to make a 90 minute version right and we went back and we interviewed the london symphony orchestra people who were who were there under under john williams so some of the principals uh and i managed to track down Anne skinner who was fantastic she was continuity on star wars and her her continuity polaroids and she even i mean in the documentary she helped sir alec guinness with that famous speech you know when he's explaining the force to to, to luke in in the hut and obi-wan's trying to explain it to him and, and he couldn't quite grasp it so so she rewrote it on her script with George's permission, ran it by George. He said, "Yeah, that's fine," and she was so modest about it. And you think, "What?" And I sat there like I said, but you, "That everyone knows that's that that's off by heart." Right. And she sat there with Sir Alec, you know, at Elgin <laughs> Studios, going, "Well, he couldn't quite get to grips with it." So he, they just and you, and if you go to the British Film Institute archive, you can see the the script with her with her you know pencil mark on where they she's written what becomes is now you know the Force Law. Right, right. <laughs> that's 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 and again, this is this is one of the things that I took from from watching the documentary was the fact that there was so much a lot of Star Wars, and we I think we know this inherently. I mean, we we know the fact that George didn't plan to have Vader be Luke's father. He didn't plan to have Luke and Leia be brother and sister. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't plan to have 
Well, you'd hope not, given the fact they had a kiss at the at the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. I mean, right. you'd hope that that wasn't in the that wasn't the plan. <laughs> if he did, then then there's some really weird <laughs> darkness going on in George's mind that we. <laughs> But um, but yeah, it, it's you know just these little things that, and that that's what's exciting about about watching your documentary. And, and again, the amazing thing about having Star Wars so well documented is just to be able to see some of these these things that we now take for granted or take as lore. The description yeah. of the Force was you know handwritten notes on the side of a script in a way. So um, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. And then. So the, the 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 next documentary you did Toy Empire after this one, correct? After yeah. So yeah. so what happened was we as I say we did the original Galaxy Britain built, and then and then we went back and and I I convinced the the commissioners at BBC Arts and and BBC World to give us a bit more money to kind of make um make the long version of of, of Galaxy. And in the same year, it was like you know, <laughs> careful what you wish for, because I said. Uh, <laughs> so a great friend of mine um has, had, had seen Galaxy Britain built, and he said, you know, you should. You know, they, there's that fantastic documentary on Netflix, The Toys That Made Us, where they looked at mm -hmm. they looked at Kenner, and and I love that documentary. And he said, hey, well, maybe we should look at. You know, have you ever thought about maybe we should make a film about you know Palatoy and and, yeah. and how the the British market and the British toy designers and what happened at Palatoy? And I have to say, I was I wasn't too sure at first. I didn't think people would be that bothered, but I thought, hang on, you're a Star Wars fan. <laughs> you know, there's loads of Star Wars fans yeah. that can enjoy that. So, so yeah. So in the same year, we we did a double bill. We did we did the extended version of the Galaxy Britain bill and did Toy Empire, um, and looked at Palatoy, which which was the firm that got the license for for Star Wars in the UK. Yeah, so the firm of Kenner, um, all owned by General Mills at the time, um, and Palatoy were doing very well because they had they had Action Man, which is you know like like GI Joe, and and they had um, you know Tiny Tears dolls and, and mainline train sets. And all of a sudden, this this thing Star Wars comes along, and there's a great story in there where um, the managing director of Palatoy tries to to palm it off to another part, another <laughs> company within the group. He says, you know, you really want to do this, you really want to do this because I've seen Star Wars and it's going to be great. And they said, oh no, it's a film, it's a film. It won't do very well. We've got this thing called Aquaman. <laughs> and he says, are "You sure? Are you, are you sure you don't want? Are you sure you don't want to take this Star Wars thing?" <laughs> and they go, "No, no, we're fine." They had Spirograph as well. We all love Spirograph. <laughs> Anyway, so they they turned down Star Wars, and they and then Palatoy took it on, and of course, yeah. it, it I think it, I think it boosted their sales that that year in seventy eight to twenty million pounds. Mm. So it had never yeah. been that big before, and it was it was just incredible. And eventually, but the problem was, I mean, it's interesting with with the Palatoy guys, that the, the marketers, the market the marketeer uh, company, uh, people mm -hmm. within the company, couldn't sell the, the figures to the to the retailers mm. because everyone thought. It's space, right? It's not going to do very well. Uh, science fiction, um, and if it's a flop, you're left with all this merchandise. So it's interesting. So their story, very much, you know, is you know, is very much in sync with George Lucas trying to sell the the, the film, and eventually 20th Century Fox taking a punt on it. Right, and no one would take a punt in the UK, certainly the, the retailers on this this line. So what they had to do was they had to they had to say look okay well Action Man's really successful if you take Star Wars mm -hmm. we'll give you big discounts on Action Man so they had to, <laughs> they had to then take it so so they then had so then had that so so we kind of looked at, at what because they were given a bit of free reign as well because because being the UK market much much smaller mm -hmm. than the US market so they had to redesign things to make things as cheaply as possible. Yeah, I think my, my favorite part of the documentary is because as a kid, I had actually I didn't have my best friend growing up, my buddy Mike, he had the Death Star playset. <laughs> and I was so jealous. And so I always I always like I, I pined over the Death Star playset. But you you do a whole section on, on the in your documentary about the the Palatoy version, yeah. which is completely different. It's a completely, completely different. Totally different. I mean, you're right, man. It was it was it, yes. Yeah, so, so so I I don't know. I mean, I think they're both great in their own right because yeah. because the, the unite the, the Kenner version was like this plastic injection molded, you know, flaws. And and it kind of and it and you think oh yeah I can see you know you could you play out the the, the kind of escape with, yeah. with Chewbacca and Han Solo and Leia and and Luke, um, but the British version was a piece of cardboard. <laughs> so it was like <laughs> it was like just kind of got like um it's like a half an orange. Yeah, but it's got the cool hallway, which that's that's what pulled oh, me yeah. in. <laughs> the, 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 the hallway, yes. the hallway is cool. And and <laughs> and uh, I'm like you, I I had you know the Falcon and the X-wing and all this. I never had the Death Star. 
but the cardboard death stars are what, what's ridiculous about the cardboard death stars is they're worth so much more now than the plastic ones i think because of course cardboard hasn't stood the test of time sure. yep. as much as the plastic ones so if you get you know a cardboard half dome death star from palatoy yeah. still in its box and still kind of where it all slots together it's got all the pieces it's worth a lot of money yeah um but of course you can imagine that as a kid you see you get that and you play with it within within a few months it's going to be looking rather sorry for itself yeah yeah we uh it's it's really funny because i think that's one of the things that i i always go back to and, and you and i were talking before the show we we both have kids at a, at a very uh you know playset sort of age i mean my my eight-year-old son i have as you can see behind me i have you know black series figures and helmets and there are times he walks in and and it just i feel really bad about like no we're not gonna open up that you ezra that. box yeah. <laughs> can you put that? my wife is like you sound like the 40 year old virgin you just <laughs> put that one down <laughs> but what's what's funny is i back in the 90s when they had the power of the force action figures that yeah. came out um, i bought I bought them all. I bought every single one. I put them in a box. And I was like, these, I'm not going to, I'm not going to miss this train. Well, that train clearly, uh, you know, I could practically, I could, if I could get what I bought them for, for most of them, I'd be happy. So the big, are they, are they worth anything? Are they worth anything? For? Not much. I mean, there's a handful that, because they're, you know, there's one or two different rarities that, that are, yeah, I could do something with them, but n not even those. And, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I found on a, a local person was selling 35 Phantom Menace action figures, like still in the box they were shipped in um, for 99 bucks. So of course I bought that. And now it's my total poor investment versus theirs. But well, that's true. So I did the same thing. I, I did exactly the same thing when the prequels came out. I've got them, I've got them in boxes in the loft. And I think yeah. they're not going to ever make what what the originals have made I mean, i've still got my original figures but they're you know they're all out of, out of their boxes obviously. yeah yeah but it, it's funny because it is the you know my every every now and then i'll let my son open up one of those power of the force action figures and just you know it's and then i, I realize i'm like this is 25 years old this thing and yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly funny. so um that's terrifying so, isn't it you think that's 25 years old don't i mean i i, I find it shocking really i was thinking of the day that the year 2000 i was only the other day yeah. Oh, that was 21 years ago. You know. A few years ago. Well, I mean, I, I did the math one time, and I was thinking, you know, with Star Wars went to, to my daughter. So she was born in 2009. Star Wars was 77. That's 30 years. That's like my dad showing me a movie from 1940. Yeah, and yeah exactly. When you do the math that way, it's very disturbing. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. That's a good point because, because yeah, I mean, I mean, the funny thing is, though, I think the great thing about Star Wars is it, it, it does stand the test of time, doesn't sure. it? And and so, so, our, so if, I, if I show my kids a, a movie um, that's even 20 years old that, that's got special effects, and there are some that are great, obviously. Yeah. And they'll look at it and they'll go, oh, Daddy, this doesn't look too good. <laughs> We're not too. But then you go back to A New Hope. And even if you watch the original before the, the, the 1997 version, it's mm -hmm. still absolutely fantastic and, yeah. and, and has stood the test of time. And so you've got to, you know, doff your cap to those wonderful people back in the seventies that that made it work. It truly really is. And again, back to 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 the the, the Empire built uh, the galaxy Britain built. Just that fact that it it was Star Wars truly is one of those magic moments, right? Everything worked. Things that shouldn't have worked worked. Things that you know they they just and and again and it spawned this phenomenal place where i mean look i'm uh 50 years old doing a, a podcast still about star wars and it's and it's it is amazing because i do have the connection my my kids have their own favorite pieces of star wars and that sort of thing and so it works out from that perspective but i i, I loved it's funny I, I catch myself sometimes saying well you know my kids love it but no i mean i'm the one getting up at five in the morning to watch <laughs> disney plus mandalorian before anybody spoils it yeah that's right that's right <laughs> So as a, so as a as a fan and a, and a filmmaker, how how did you so you said Force Awakens kind of pulled you back mm. into Star Wars? How did you respond to the sequel trilogy? And how does that you know as a fan, um, where where does that that fit for you as far as the 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 impact and and maybe the way those movies affected you? Right. Okay. Well, I, I was wondering if I was going to get this question. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because I I know that I know that um, a lot of people got very excited about about you know. The Force Awakens. I mean, I I saw The Force Awakens. I think nine times at the, the cinema. You know, I was I was very kind of 
buoyed up by it, you know. Uh, apart from when Han Solo dies, no! oh, so painful. But, yeah, yeah. You know, but, <laughs> but you know, and, and I remember, I remember seeing JJ talking about it, and I thought he, he was right to do that because it was it moved the story on, mm-hmm. um, uh, and it did move the story on uh, very much so. Um, I. I think overall, for me, the the sequel trilogy, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed it, and I know that there's been division with, with with certain people who who've not enjoyed certain aspects of 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 the sequel trilogy. But but I think some things were set up um, in the Force Awakens that I kind of expected to carry on. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I kind of you know I I kind of expected to see more. Div- I, I mean, I, I I kind of got the fact I thought Finn was going to be a Jedi. I mm. kind of thought Finn was going to be a Jedi, and I, yeah. I think. I think I could see that coming, um, and then and then it, things went in a different direction. Um, but yeah, I, I I think the whole kind of era after you know that it's it's the expectation is so high, isn't it? I think yeah. the expectation is really high um, with 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 the sequel trilogy. I think for me, you know, if, if I have to, and this, this and I sound I'm going to be biased here, <laughs> but my favourite film, kind of as people say in the Disney Lucasfilm era, has yeah. to be. I think is Rogue One. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think I think because I mean, well, I'm biased because I've become friends with with Colin Gowdy who edited it and Gareth Edwards who directed it, and mm-hmm. they're in the Galaxy Britain built. Um, but I suppose with that, it's it's interesting, isn't it? I saw your interview with with Hal Hickel, mm-hmm. and, and you, you were saying to him that you know with that and the Mandalorian, they are very much connected to mm-hmm. uh, those original the original trilogy. Um, and also, there are so many. Uh, they, they pay so much homage to the to, to rebels, to the Clone Wars, certainly in the Mandalorian. Sure. Um, uh, but I think I think with with the sequel trilogy, um, I don't want to dig myself too much into a hole. With it. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> but I, but this is the thing. I I mean, I really. Wait, I'm, I'm going to really... tweet out right now that David Whiteley hates the sequels. Hold on a second. Let me tweet that. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. <laughs> the thing is, I don't. And actually. No. And actually, this is going to sound because I mean, oh God, I'm going to, I'm just going to fess up now. I just, I, I get very, I've had a beer. You see, I get very emotional when I watch Star Wars. Star Wars yeah. connects me to my late father because um, mm-hmm. we watched all the films together, and and he, equally the prequels. And he's not around anymore; he died very young. And, and I, and I, I have this connection with it. And and even in, and you know, there are there are aspects like so. So in the Last Jedi, you know, when we when we when we lose Luke Skywalker. You know, I I was I was heartbroken. You know, yeah. and 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 equally when we lose, and obviously in re- real life we we lost Carrie Fisher. You know, and 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 you, and when she dies in in the Rise of Skywalker, yeah. You know, and then you lose Han Solo, and you're thinking all these connections. But equally, I I still found it. I still find the Rise of I find the Rise of Skywalker very uplifting. Actually, mm. yeah. um, that kind of and I, and the music. I mean, it's like. I've got the soundtrack in here. You know, the it's like John Williams. They've said to John Williams, right? This is your. This is your. This is it. This is it, JW. You've been on this ride since '76, man. You can go go crazy. And he brings all brings all the every aspect, every element that he that is that has made those films. And I and I just, but you know, the last film, I just really loved. You know, mm. really, I really enjoyed it. But I I did enjoy the whole the whole experience of the of the sequel trilogy. Yeah, yeah. I, I know there. Are, of course, there are aspects of every film you, you're not necessarily going to. You're not going to please all the people all the time. Sure. Yep. yep. But for me, I I, I overall enjoyed the, the sequel trilogy. Yeah, and it's it's funny too because I you know I as as a uh, as a up over my head nerd uh, of Star Wars stuff. You know, you do you take too much of it seriously and things like that. But at the end of the day, they're all fun Star Wars. The Star Wars movies, and they're they're there's a re, you know it's like. Uh, uh, I used to ask in my 10 question segment, what's your least favorite Star Wars movie? And Jason Fry, who wrote The Last Jedi yeah. uh, novelization, said, I'm going to put it this way. It's my 11th favorite. So and and that's, kind of, you know, sure. He you know, he's got a career to worry about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, it's it's it. That's true. I mean, I'm not going to not watch any of them. Right. I mean, there's absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I remember, I remember when the prequels came out, and I mentioned just now that I saw them with my dad, and I lo- I enjoyed them to start with, and then I didn't particularly like them. I then kind of went off them, um, but now I watch them with my children, and mm-hmm. I actually feel that they're really great, and I and I and I really love the. I think the I think Revenge of the Sith is fantastic. Um, I can I can say right, so let's put that on, you know, and mm-hmm. and you know, I don't like every film all the way from beginning to end. <laughs> 
but a lot of them I do. So, you know, and I think that if, if someone said, if, I, if, if someone had one of them on, I'd be like, right, I'm just sitting and watch it, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm cliche in the sense that Empire Strikes Back is still my favorite, sure. you know, but I love Rogue One and I, I do love Rise of Skywalker. Return of the Jedi will always have a special place in my heart because the first one I saw in the cinema. Yeah. Of course, New Hope, you know, and, and, and The Force Awakens. And I, and I just, I just really enjoy the whole aspect of Star Wars and the Mandalorian as well. Just, you know, just another level, isn't it? Do you, uh, do you watch much of the animated series? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, haven't kind of really got into the Clone Wars as much as I should have done, but I've done all the Rebels series. Mm -hmm. Um, with the kids and i just i, I remember i remember buying that uh, we bought the pilot on on dvd or blu-ray and i said mm -hmm. i said do you want to watch this and they kept saying no they're quite young and they said oh no i'm not sure daddy it's a cartoon it's a cartoon and i said no i really want to watch this come on guys let's watch it we watched that first pilot episode and by the end of it they were like this is fantastic this is the best <laughs> ever. so we then kind of you know got all the series and just and couldn't wait for every series to come out and, and, and really enjoyed it. Just fantastic. And the way they're connecting everything. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's brilliant. what I'm excited about as well is this kind of, you know, one of the questions that I, I, I've, I've asked a lot of folks is, is, you know, what makes a star Wars story, a star Wars story right now with the, the quote unquote end of the Skywalker saga, I think we're seeing that it's actually, it's this bigger, universe and the skywalkers of course had this sort of the spine of the book if you will on on the story but the story itself is is sort of surrounding them and i think that's one of the great things about what we're seeing now is um you know not only seeing animated figures come to life in 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 the live action but just the story kind of growing and and star wars is it's almost becoming its own genre right because you have video games and comic books and novels yeah. and and young adult books and everything but they're all in that world and and i again i don't know what that stems from it's so hard to find that magic and if 1977 if things went slightly off the rails we uh, what would it be i wonder i mean i wonder yeah. what would would we have a saga like this would we have a story that is really the mythology is so overstated and i feel like uh i, I back in the day i did a i used to do a talk about it called you know the mythology of star wars and um but it's it's what it is and and it's it's interesting that it's it's survived this long and it, it not just survived i mean it's thriving it's yeah. doing really well yeah i mean who would have said i mean as i said earlier you know the kind of wilderness years of of star wars right um who'd have thought that in 2021 you know, or the end of 2020, you know, you'd have the, the Disney Investor Day where they announced 10, you know, new series and, you know, the Mandalorian is, is doing brilliantly well. And, and you've got, and you've got this character, you know, who's, who's everyone's called Baby Yoda and it's Grogu and, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's going from strength to strength to strength. And you've got the Ahsoka series coming up and, and Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and Andor and everything else. And also, you know, you've got the High Republic and, and, and it just seems to kind of keep growing and growing. Um, uh, I mean, Disney ain't stupid. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> successful and everyone is always after the next Star Wars. I remember when I interviewed Gary Kurtz, and we did the last interview with Gary Kurtz. You know, he said, you know, it's it's very rare for a, for a studio to, to, to take um, a punt on something now that isn't the next Star Wars, isn't the next Marvel, um, isn't the next something in, in, within a, a big franchise because... Yeah. You know, obviously, um, studios need to make money, and they want to make money, and they want things to be successful. So, getting so the, the independent sector is it's, it's more difficult for some for some. Obviously, there are, there are aspects of that that thrive. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but you know, finding the next Star Wars, it's it's virtually impossible, isn't it? Because it, you could just, as you say, it it's not. It did, I mean, obviously, Luke Skywalker was brought into the end of season two of the Mandalorian. At the mm -hmm. end, which we all, you know. And I shed a tear over that. I thought it was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> but, but you know, it, it just goes to show that it is bigger, isn't it? And I love the fact that 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 Mando and everybody else don't seem to know what the force is. Yes, or, yeah. or what Jedi are, you know. And, and I, I love that. And I, I always chuckle a little bit when I see people like, well, how that seems a little ridiculous that Ray didn't know, but it's a pretty big galaxy. Like, I don't yeah. know what's going on two towns over from me, <laughs> much less you know, on the, the entire galaxy. You got Facebook. That's right. <laughs> I'm on Facebook. <laughs> Way too much, too. Look at the community page and you know what's going on. They don't know what's going on in another system <laughs> at the outer rim, for God's sake. 
right? What is this? Somebody selling a lightsaber? I don't know what this is. Somebody selling you there a back to? Where's that? <laughs> I'm not going all the way over to this time of night. <laughs> Forget it. Um, so you you mentioned things that are on the horizon, and one of them, of course, is Book of Boba Fett, which I'm so excited about. But you have a Boba Fett project on the horizon as well. Is that correct? This is very yes, it's true. It's it's something that kind of came out of it came out of it stemmed from the Galaxy Britain built. So so we we done that doc and. Um, and then I left the BBC at the end of last year after nearly 23 years, and I and I started up my own production company. And um, I don't just make Star Wars documentaries, but but this guy came to me and he said, "Look," he said, um, he sent me an email. Said uh, we were very instrumental in making um, Star Wars costumes mm-hmm. for C3PO and R2D2, and we helped make the original parts for for Boba Fett. I thought that's interesting. That's okay, and I kind of let it, it mold. I molded over for a while. Um, and I thought, is there something in this? And this is long before I, I mean, obviously the Mandalorian was around and this was before I obviously knew anything about, sure. you know, Tamara Morrison coming back and reprising the role of, of Boba Fett. Um, Cause we all thought he ended up in the Sarlacc pit and that was the sure. end of it. Um, <laughs> no one's know. ever really gone though, as Luke told us in last show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one's ever really gone, yeah. That's right. Even when there's a giant belch from you know, a creature in the middle right. of the desert, you're never really gone. <laughs> um so you just have some horrific scarring um but and the jawas have your armor <laughs> but anyway he, he crawls out and and then we see him so so basically we, we decided to kind of do, do a whole sort of short film if you like shorter than the galaxy britain built on the kind of the evolution of the character of the costume um uh, so i went back and interviewed robert watts um mm-hmm. who's the associate producer on the empire strikes back and very sadly, we, we we wanted to obviously speak with to, to, to Jeremy Bullock. Yeah. And uh, he's sadly no longer with us. Um, but we spoke to Robert about it because he was Robert. He's Robert's half brother. Oh, so Robert, Robert gave him the job. Oh, that's so, interesting. I no yeah. So, so Robert's evolution is interesting because he he was supervisor, production supervisor on Star Wars and then associate producer and then producer on um, uh, Return of the Jedi. And end up producing a lot of the Indiana Jones films. Um, so, so he gave he gave he phoned Jeremy up and said, "Listen, there's a if you basically if you fit the costume, the job's yours." <laughs> so he got him down to the studio. And he, anyway, so we did that, and and we we're looking at the, the the white super trooper and a lot of the artwork. We're looking at a lot of the artwork as well, and then we're looking. At, we, then then we've gone back to these guys. This company, an engineering company, very near to Elstree um, Studios. They were making they were making the most incredible stuff for um, space exploration. They had military contracts, government contracts, so stuff was actually really precise. And then you get these guys, these production designers, coming and going, "Can you make this?" And as aesthetic, and as long as it was aesthetically right, it didn't right. matter about accuracy. So of course, they think, "Oh, great, this is fantastic." They've been paid a lot of money to make this stuff, so they made a lot of stuff for for, for Boba Fett. And um, they're now recreating what they did with with the measurements with from what they did back in back in the day. So they're recreating the the range the range finder stalk wow. and the, the bits and the ears and and the laser. Um, and and yeah, so we've we've been kind of following their story really. So it's a bit of kind of the history of the character and the evolution. Um, and it's virtually all in the can. So it's it's nearly all done. So That's nearly- great. Now, so I know a lot of people who who watch my show unfortunately don't have BBC to be able to catch your uh, your documentaries. Are there is there any place online where they can see them? Or probably not. I guess it's no, no. it's really sad actually. But so what happened was, um, Toy Empire went out on BBC World, BBC America over Christmas again, mm-hmm. been out a few times, um, and Gal- Galaxy Britain built been out a few times. But unfortunately, at the moment, it just it la- they languish in a BBC vault. <laughs> uh, I can't. Um, but like, it'd be nice if they could actually release those. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. Uh, but but you, as you said, like if you have access to BBC, keep your eyes open for it. Yeah, it, does, it will kind of rotate through. Um, well, David, we have the uh, the the ten question segment of the show. Oh. I'd love to to run you through this gauntlet if you're Definitely. if you're done with it. So uh... get ready. Okay. For what? Every time we run that, I think I'm nervous now. 
be. I'm <laughs> I feel like that may be a little bit over the top. Well, as I as I tell all my no, guests, no, no. I, like it. <laughs> I tell all my guests, uh, I won't judge you, but I can't guarantee others won't. So this will be fine. So <laughs> the, the, first, the first question on the list, and we touched on it a bit, but what is your favorite Star Wars movie, TV show, or book? Oh, I'm afraid it has to be. I'm the cliche as I said earlier, The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, it, it's everybody's choice for a reason, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry. It, it, I, I've always loved it, and I, I, it's always going to be my number one. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's funny because you know I, I went back and as I'm approaching 100th episode, I've been listening to yeah. some of my older shows, which, as you know, as a, as a, as a journalist and a presenter, you listen to your old stuff and you just you can't. It's very <laughs> hard to listen to. But oh, uh, I, I, go back. There was a, a gentleman, there's a, a show called uh, Four Center out uh, there based in the West Coast. And uh, Joseph Scrimshaw said he didn't even realize that like the reason his favorite colors are blue and orange is because of the marketing for Empire State. Like it just played such a, it oh, just wow. so deeply into yeah. into your world, right? So uh, yeah, Empire. Uh, Gosh, well, I'm not, I'm not, maybe, maybe that's why I love those colors too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next question is, okay, you can live on any Star Wars planet. Where are you going to call home? Oh, my word. Um, gosh, that's difficult. Um, I think Naboo's pretty good, actually. I think I think Naboo seems a pretty cool place to live. I quite yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to go with Naboo. All right. Okay. Lush and green and, I wouldn't, and, Tatoo, and Tatooine or Jakku. Ooh, no. Oh, we get it. <laughs> Come on. I live in England. Why on earth would I want to live on a hop? <laughs> yeah, you you holiday in, in Italy, so why not live on a planet oh, Italy, no, right? Of course. <laughs> so would you consider yourself a rebel or an imperial? Oh, I've got to be a rebel. Got to be a rebel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's that's one of those ones that uh, usually doesn't require much follow up. Yeah, I'm gonna say <laughs> is what is okay. What is is your favorite Star Wars sound effect? Okay, so I think people would expect me to probably say um, the lightsaber, but my, my favourite sound effect is when the um, Millennium Falcon never works properly and Han Solo has to give it a kick, a, a whack. Um, the, the kind of, you know, the 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 the, the, giant, the, giant, well, the engine kind of sounding like it's coming down and down and down and down and down. And down and yeah. I mean, all, all the Star Wars sound effects are fabulous, aren't they? I mean, Ben Burt, what a genius. Um, you know, I mean, without him, there would not be the soundscape of Star Wars. So, so, but yeah, it has to be that, that, um, the, the sound of the engine cranking down. Yeah. Again, that's one of those things that happened to work extremely well in Star Wars with different yeah. sound, a different soundscape, a uh, 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 Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon soundscape and oh. it's a completely different film. Right. So one ingredient wrong and that's it. Yep. 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 Yeah, I totally, totally agree. I've I've told a few people this. My first, my very first interview ever was uh, Ben Burt, which was what? oh my word, that is fantastic. Yeah, so I'm I'm very excited to have spoken to yeah. him. That was that was great. That's okay, great. the fifth question: Who or what? I'm not sure what it is. Is your favorite droid? <sighs> wow. Um, well, he used to be. I mean, I, I've always loved R two D two. Is it R2D? Oh, yeah, see, I do like K2 as well, you see. Because <laughs> Alan Tudyk breathes such wonderful life into him. I really hope they bring him into uh, into Andor. I know he yeah. said the other day he wasn't sure if he was going to be in it, but um, K2. I'm going to go with R2D2. I'll stick okay. with the original because he's been in most of them. You can't go wrong with R2. Yeah, he just, uh, that was, I think, you know, a, a number of people, and I, it's one of the few things that I would say about the sequels that I wish I wish we had a little bit more of R2. But he did yeah. have, to me, the scene in Last Jedi where he plays Leia's uh, hologram is just oh. brilliant. 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 Absolutely superb. Really well done. Okay, question six. If you could own any spaceship or vehicle in the Star Wars universe, what would it be? I, mean, used to, I used to say the Falcon, but... I love the I, I do love the Razor Crest now until they blew it up. Um, <laughs> I, I everyone just went no. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, that's a good one. I I think the Falcon would be a lot of work. I think it's <laughs> a lot of maintenance there. Um, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go slightly left field and say the speeder bike because you could pop to the shops on a speeder bike. Right. You're not going to need much kind of maintenance of the speed of bike. It would be like a moped of, <laughs> of, of the Star Wars world. And I think you could just have it sitting outside. Yeah, I'm just popping to get some milk. You <laughs> jump on it and, and away you go. Whereas the Falcon would take you be hitting the damn thing all the time. And 
the compressors will be going and all that. The hyper, you know, the hyperdrive would be leaking. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with a speeder bike actually. Yeah, I think that's uh, utilitarian. It'll work, and it's not going to. Plus, it's got you know one of my favorite sound effects, which is the sound of that that bike uh, kicking up. Oh yeah, yeah. And how great was it to see them come back in Mandalorian? Just, oh, to, just superb. Yeah, it was very. You know, again, I'm kind, of, kind of picturing the. I was picturing the one in the Mandalorian. Yeah, it's it does look very cool, doesn't it? But it, the, you can't go wrong with this. You said earlier about your kids playing with it. So yeah. this is my original. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's an original one. Very nice. It broke the body when they were playing with it in here, and I had to then go on eBay and buy a new bit. And I was like, <laughs> no, it's fine. I was like. <laughs> Yes, having kids and uh, Star Wars collectibles in, in requires a lot of, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> you shut the door and go, <laughs> <laughs> no. I've gotten to the point with some of the Black Series figures where I know now my son's style, so I have to buy two of them sometimes and just. Uh, there you go. There you so, go. It costs you a fortune. It costs me too much. Yeah. He, he's not going to be able to go to college, but that's okay. He has. He, well, he'll, he'll have all the toys to show for it. He's got a Stormtrooper. It's fine. Um <laughs> So, so we were just talking about collectibles. What is your favorite collectible? And it doesn't have to be something you can buy off the shelf, but what's what's the one thing that you start with um, collectible you'll oh, never yeah. part with? Um, uh, I've got my original figures. I've got my original Falcon still. I love those. But mm. I do have a, um, a Master Replicas uh, Return of the Jedi hilt, numbered hilt of, of Luke Skywalker's. Um, that's probably my favorite. That's probably Excellent. my favorite. Yeah, how great was it to see the green lightsaber back in Mando? Yeah, well, that was that was the one. That was the hilt. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, oh, that's 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 what I got. It's a piece of turned metal. It's ridiculous. That's, yeah. you know, I get excited about a piece of turned metal, but you know, it it's like so saying early when I got the hilt, the, the lightsaber, and holding that, it's the same kind of weighted feel. Yeah, it's got the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's um, and that's you know, it's, we just I was talking, I think it was last week with uh, somebody about. Uh, about the lightsaber hilts and, and mine sort of tend to rotate between which one I like. I'm kind of in an original Obi-Wan kind of mindset lately. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. Boring as that one was. No, I think it's cool. I think it's cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Question number eight, if you could be any character in star Wars, who would it be? And why would you choose that character? Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar Binks. I, uh, okay. 99 episodes. Nobody's ever said Jar Jar. You got to explain this one. No, I'm joking. No, I, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I, I, I always, I'll tell you, I'm a great character. My kids are playing Star Wars Lego today on the on the Xbox, and I thought he's just such a fun character. Yeah. Um, and I and I think everybody else would be so serious in everything else, wouldn't they? Can you imagine if you went round being? I mean, as much as I, I, you know, I've, every, I think maybe I, I always grew up wanting to be Han Solo, really. Right. Um, but I imagine the burden of being Han Solo. You know, yeah. but if you but if you but if you jar jar binks, you can just have fun. <laughs> and no one's ever going to ask you to do anything serious. <laughs> this is true. You know, true. Apart from that one time when he took that vote, didn't he? He did, <laughs> he, 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 he did the motion, didn't he? Okay, right. apart from okay, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so just to be responsible for the entire fall of the Republic. Yeah, okay, other so than that, there's... on that in, in, on that front. Okay, I'll go with Han Solo then. I'll go okay. with Han Solo. Han Solo. Han Solo on a speeder bike. On sale on a speeder bike, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but very nearly uh, Jar Jar. You can tell it's late here, can't you? And I'm trying. Yeah, to... it's, it's getting late. That's 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 fine now. That's good. Uh, question number nine is: What is your favorite Star Wars moment? Oh, I, I have lots of favorite Star Wars moments. Um, I think. Okay, can I can I say a couple of my last say a couple pieces? Sure. That... Yeah, you know it, it's late there. I'm going to give you. <laughs> I'm have a couple. So so uh, I think. I do like I do like the bit in the in in the Rise of Skywalker when she says and I'm all the Jedi and brings the lightsaber from behind her. Yeah, and the noise of them clashing together. I think yeah. is fantastic. I also think one of my one of my the one in the Force Awakens when he stops and he says you knew Luke Skywalker and Han Solo turns around that that realization that he knew. But I think if I had to choose one overall. And it goes back to my love of Return of the Jedi, having seen it in the cinema, mm -hmm. when they're in Death Star 2, mm -hmm. everything's collapsing around them, and, and I think Wedge is punched through the fire, and and, the, and Lando is still in, engulfed in flames in the Millennium Falcon. Right. And it's like it's almost like hope's lost, and, they, and they're not going to make it, and they're being chased by the TIE fighters, and the music, and the crescendo's coming to the music. And then it, it the, the flames come out first. Yes. And then yep. through the flames, the Falcon comes through. And that yeehaw moment, and that that to me 
if somebody had to, if somebody if I did describe Star Wars to somebody who wasn't one of the initiated like our good selves, um, that for me that is Star Wars. When Star Wars makes you go yes, then that to me is is what Star Wars is all about. If Star Wars makes you feel like good has overcome evil, and 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 you've just saved yourselves and and the galaxy in the nick of time, then that's that's Star Wars, and that for me I think is is one of the best moments in Star Wars. That's great. That's a that's a really great moment. I love that. That's a that's a great perspective <laughs> on it as well. Cool. And the last question is, what is your favorite Star Wars quote? Ooh. Um, <laughs> Gosh, that's I used to I used to have, I used to think this is made of force with you, but that's just so boring. I couldn't say that. <laughs> um, as much as it's great, I mean, it's um, oh, I always think I I always used in in life. You must do whatever you feel is right. Of course, yeah, that's that's <laughs> I, a great quote. And you know, it's funny. I, the funny the funny thing about Star Wars quotes, when I, especially with this question, when I when I ask people, is there's two different types of quotes, right? There's the 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 deep sort of philosophy yeah. that you live your life by um and then there's the one that you end up using a lot and actually you must do what you feel is right of course is probably both <laughs> in a way right yeah that's that's true you're right there are, there are kind of the, the more frivolous ones that are fun within the you know i've got a bad feeling about this kind of thing right. and, et cetera, within within the star wars universe but and there's the deep and profound ones and you know yeah remember the force will be with you always um but but that, that yeah that, that kind of that kind of straddles both camps i think i think you're right i think it's it's kind of both in there isn't it that's fantastic that's great well david this has been a ton of fun tell people where they can find you online and keep up with you and well I, yeah well I, I still have a very odd uh twitter name friends of my team to change it but it's my old tv <laughs> show so it's at david underscore inside out um we've we've got a we've got a, a bit of our boba fett documentary on our star wars uh youtube channel star wars extra so extra without the e um so you can find me there galaxy productions gratuitous plug and and the book the book is out as well the galaxy britain built book is on amazon so yes actually i saw that that's definitely uh you, you got to pick that up if you can't watch the documentary read the book and, and you know, do book both anyway. Do both. Right? <laughs> well, David, thank you so much. I hope to have you on again oh, sometime. This was oh, man, really I, fantastic. I really enjoyed this, Pete. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Um, and, and thank you for, for having me on. Oh, the pleasure was all mine, man. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Around the Galaxy. Thanks to our guests and thank you for hanging out. If you had fun, please like, subscribe, and share. If you really liked it, please feel free to head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash beyondtheblastdoors. You can also find that link on beyondtheblastdoors.com where you can keep up with this show and all the shows on the Beyond the Blast Doors network, as well as find a link to our merch store. And if you use the code ATGCAST, you'll get 10% off your order. So until next time, this has been Pete Fletzer, and we'll see you for our next trip around the galaxy. Around the Galaxy is copyright 2021 Pete and Seat Studios. Our music is brought to us by the band Silver Colored Knob, whose music can be found on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find music. <laughs>